Good evening. My name is Uta Poige, and I'm the Dean of the College of Social Sciences and Humanities here at Northeastern. And it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 29th Robert Solomon Morton Memorial Lecture. I have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about the history of this important intellectual exchange for Northeastern and Boston communities. And then my colleague, Simon Rabinovich, will really get our intellectual discussions of this um, evening underway. I hope you will join me in um, thinking together about the legacy that the Morton and Giessen families have brought to us by generously supporting efforts of bringing leading intellectuals to Boston and Northeastern to reflect on the legacies of the Holocaust, also the Holocaust in the context of comparative genocide. And this legacy really started at Northeastern relatively early compared to other universities in 1977. We have a chance encounter in a barbershop in Cambridge to thank for this tradition. Robert Solomon Morton was born in Frankfurt in Germany in 1906. He was educated in the school of the Orthodox synagogue there, and a particularly harrowing experience in 1934, relatively soon after the Nazis came to power, convinced him that he had no choice but to apply for emigration to the United States. That process took three years, and it resulted in his coming to Boston. For many years, Robert Solomon Morton and his wife Sophie were caretakers of the Hillel Foundation, Hillel Foundation at Harvard. And it was during this time at, Har at Hillel and Harvard that a chance meeting at a barber shop brought Robert Solomon Morton together with Bill Giesen, who was then a postdoctoral fellow at MIT. Giesen was quite a bit younger than Bo Morton, but also was born in Germany and went on to teach chemistry and mechanical engineering at Northeastern for over 40 years. He grew up in the same city that Robert Solomon Morton had been forced to leave, and he was educated there during the Nazi years and their immediate aftermath. The encounter in that Cambridge barbershop resulted in long-term friendship and an ongoing conversation between Bill Giesen and Robert Solomon Morton. Bill Giesen eventually created the Robert Solomon Memorial Lecture as a way of memorializing a person who for him embodied, and so for so many others, I should add, embodied a spirit of understanding and reconciliation, certainly very important themes always. I'm particularly um, grateful, I have to say, that Robert Solomon's grandchildren and the Robert Solomon Morton's um, family took a great interest in the exchanges that Giesen's and uh, Morton's legacy meant for Northeastern. And I want to very much thank the members of the Morton family, some of whom are here today, for their generous support. It is their support that at this point has made this into a permanent tradition for the university. And so thank you so much. I so remember um, the encounters both with Robert Solomon Morton's son and his grandsons and really cherish what the family has done for the university. Thank you so much. <laughs> It is then my pleasure to turn the mic over in just a minute to my colleague Simon Rabinovich, who is the Stotsky Associate Professor of Jewish Studies here at Northeastern, and he will introduce today's program. I want to thank Simon and the entire Holocaust and Comparative Genocide Awareness Committee for tonight's program, as well as for the wonderful programs of this week that they have brought to Northeastern and Boston audiences, and also additional programs that have been going on since the fall. So a hand of applause to all of you organizers of these exchanges as well. And let me just say two or three sentences about Simon. Um, Simon teaches and writes about different aspects of Jewish, European, Russian, and legal history. He really always works at the intersections of legal and Jewish history. And he most recently published a volume that is called Defining Israel, the Jewish State, Democracy, and the Law, and is currently working on a book that will be forthcoming with Yale University Press that is called Religious Freedom and the Jews, Collective Rights in Modern States. As we will, I would think, learn today, 
questions that really are very, very important questions of collective as well as individual rights in the context of the various conflicts that we are seeing in today's world as well. So without further ado, over to you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dean Poiger, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, and welcome to uh, the 29th Annual Morton Lecture. And as Dean Poiger mentioned, this is a very special event because it serves as the keynote event each year in our week and indeed our year of Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Programming. And it was really nice to hear uh, a little bit about the history of this program and the wonderful support we've had uh, from the Morton family. Now, we've had a, a few lectures this calendar year, and in our very first lecture uh, by Jeffrey Weidlinger, this came just days after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine began. And in it, really coincidentally, Professor Weidlinger discussed the history and legacy of anti-Jewish violence in Ukraine in the first half of the 20th century, and how Ukraine has struggled to memorialize properly and um, to understand the anti-Jewish violence. Uh, but even so, one of the interesting dynamics uh, of the current conflict is how much what it means to be a Ukrainian has changed just since the beginning of the conflict, uh, let alone the decades beforehand. And yet, even so, this cynical weaponization of the past by Russia and Russian propaganda, I should say, defining the current Ukrainian state preposterously as a Nazi regime has pushed the past to the center of this conflict and really has demonstrated just how alive these questions of uh, memory and memorialization and, and the law are still present in European life and society. And now, here we are, eager to hear from the perspective of uh, our guest, uh, who is an ex expert in such matters, um, on the use of the law to distort the memory of the Holocaust in Poland at a time when the world is taking measure of the atrocities Russia is committing in Bucha, in Irpin, in Mariupol, and trying to find the proper language to describe it, right, within the law, within our moral compasses. And it's in this dark context that I'm grateful to have as our guest, Jan Grabowski, a historian of the Holocaust and of Eastern Europe and of the dynamics of mass murder, who, as we will hear, has been at the center and the subject of um, many of these legal efforts by the Polish state to shape and distort how the history of the Holocaust is remembered within Poland. Professor Grabowski is the author of, among many books and publications, Hunt for, Ju Hunt for the Jews, Betrayal and Murder in German-Occupied Poland, uh, which won the Yad Vashem International Book Prize. He is also the editor of the soon forthcoming Night Without End, The Fate of Jews in German-Occupied Poland, which is the English edition of a Polish work that came out in 2018 um, that became the center of much of this legal conflict, which uh, I think we are going to hear about. Uh, Professor Grabowski is also a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, which, as a Canadian, I can attest to is a very big deal, <laughs> um, and is currently serving uh, in the honorary role of Cleveringa Chair at Leiden University. Now, before I pass the proceedings over to Professor Grabowski, I do want to acknowledge all the people who made this, uh, this event uh, and this week and all of our programming possible. Um, first, to the committee, to the Holocaust and Genocide Awareness Committee, uh, who have worked very hard at putting our programming together. Um, to my colleague, Lori Lefkowitz, uh, who is my partner in all things, 
uh, and is also the Ruderman Chair of Jewish Studies uh, and um, the Director of the Humanities Center at the University. Um, to Dean Utapoiger, uh, who has been a steadfast supporter of all of our programming, um, and of course, especially to the Morton family um, for allowing us to honor the legacy uh, of, um, of, of the entire family's devotion to, um, to this intellectual inquiry. Um, and I'm very happy that Danny Caspis can be here in the, in the audience to, um, to participate. Um, it's also uh, a very good opportunity for me to remind the students in the audience of scholarships that we have within the university to support um, both Jewish studies and the study of the Holocaust. Um, and so one is the Ruderman Scholarship for Minors in Jewish Studies, and we are very thankful of uh, the support of the Ruderman family. I'm glad uh, that we have uh, representatives here um, for this event, um, as well as the Gideon Klein Award, which supports the study of, um, uh, of, the Holocaust, of the music in the Holocaust, um, which has been newly endowed uh, this year by the Holocaust Legacy Foundation, which we're very appreciative of. And we have uh, members of the audience here with us who have held both of those, uh, both of those scholarships, which um, I'm glad to see. Um, and our wonderful uh, banner carriers, flag bearers um, for, the, for the wonderful programming we have here um, and the benefits, I think, of um, the support of our donors in our community. Um, finally, uh, I'd like to thank Gabby Fiorenza uh, and Deborah Levison uh, for their work in putting, uh, for, for making, making the, the gears turn. Um, and I just want to note that uh, Professor Grabowski will, will give his, his thoughts, uh, and then we'll have question and answers at the end, so everybody will have a, an opportunity for discussion. Um, and with that, uh, Professor Grabowski, we eagerly anticipate <laughs> hearing from you. Oh, thank, you. <clears throat> thank you very much for this uh, wonderful introduction and um, for your hospitality, um, Boston, was uh, one of my first places I stayed for a longer time after my migration from Poland in 1988, uh, struggling to become a Canadian citizen from here. In any case, I am delighted and thank you for, uh, for this invitation. Um, the topic which I wanted to discuss with you today is uh, fairly complex uh, um, and uh, one in which I am personally engaged in which is not always comfortable from professional historian's point of view. Um, someone uh, who was, let's say, I was raised in, educated in so-called the German school of history. Um, we are supposed to be very distant uh, from the events which we discuss. It is in the case of the Holocaust, it's not uh, always possible. Perhaps it should not even be uh, possible. Now, um, in order to introduce uh, the topic, I would like to start uh, with, uh, with yellow envelopes. Uh, actually, working as a professor of history at University of Ottawa um, for many, many years, I received once or twice per year large yellow envelopes postmarked, I believe, in New Hampshire somewhere. And inside there was literature proving to me beyond any doubt that uh, Holocaust never happened. Um, you could, I could see um, articles and photographs of uh, proving beyond any doubt that gas chambers were simply not uh, ever constructed, that it was everything Jewish fabrication. Um, it was very naive. It was uh, very primitive. And it kept coming. And then one day it stopped. Uh, and uh, in the past, I thought to myself that uh, this Holocaust denial, it really is a spent force. Um, intellectually speaking, quite definitely so. Um, and uh, then the situation started to evolve along different lines. Namely, it doesn't, I wouldn't like to say that Holocaust denial is not dangerous but it has been largely replaced by a different kind of threat which I want to uh, discuss or tell you more about today, 
um, which is much more insidious intellectually. It can be much more seducing. And it's applicable not only to the history of the Holocaust, but to various uh, intellectual pursuits and understanding of our consciousness and understanding of history in general. And this is something called the Holocaust distortion. Now, the second thing why, why Holocaust denial um, pales when compared to this uh, current threat um, is the sponsors. Um, the Holocaust denial was very much a cottage industry uh, propelled by strange people, we can say. Um, Holocaust distortion is a state-financed uh, um, and state-approved uh, methodology of uh, distorting our understanding of history or denying the history itself. Now, a few slides. I will start with uh, a place that uh, that you certainly heard of, uh, which is uh, a place I visit very often. Um, whenever in Warsaw, and actually I arrived from Warsaw just last week, and I will be going back to Warsaw uh, next week. Uh, Treblinka is a small location about 70 or 50 miles, speaking in American terms, uh, northeast of Warsaw. It is also the second largest after Auschwitz, a Jewish uh, killing field, the cemetery in the world, where the ashes of 900,000 Jews are scattered. And uh, I have a sort of uh, uh, understanding with myself that whenever I am in Poland, I will try at least once every few months to be in Treblinka, um, uh, just to be there. It's a forest and a meadow. It's very remote, uh, and there are there is a monument, there are small monuments, but uh, there are no barracks, there is no physical presence. Uh, well, not exactly. Actually, when you, uh, when you, uh, when you walk to, uh, to this huge meadow, which is the place where the extermination camp, where the death camp actually stood, um, I went there last time in November, uh, and it was a very sad day with uh, clouds crying out and uh, the rain uh, dripping. I went with my two of my friends, uh, and uh, one of them, she is a cultural anthropologist, and she practically lives in Treblinka, I must say, um, photographing everything. So uh, once uh, I, I sort of uh, looked at the ground under my feet, and I saw those tiny little white specks, uh, little pebbles, I thought, but they are too small. They actually are pieces of uh, unburned bones which come, which come to the surface after every rain. War Earth is working, and after the 80 years, it's a place where actually the ashes, the bodies of hundreds of thousands of people were burned and later on uh, buried, uh, these remnants, the ashes, and they come, they, they come to the surface. So this is a place where you can feel. You can feel history. Uh, touching you with its cold hand or grabbing you by your throat. Um, and uh, Treblinka has one meaning, and this is the memory of the nearly one million people, innocent people who had a chance to live, and this chance has been denied to them. Now, and here we enter with politics of the 21st, politics of memory of the 21st century. Um, I learned to my utter shock, that the Polish authorities uh, unveiled at Treblinka railway station, um, unveiled a monument. You can see a Catholic priest uh, blessing a monument uh, to a courageous Polish railway worker who, as they said, brought water to Jews who were dying of thirst in the wagons in the wagons uh, waiting for their push into the extermination camp in Treblinka. The railway station in uh, which we will see here, this is the place of former railway station at Tre in Treblinka. Uh, this railway station in Treblinka was uh, a place of utter horror. This was a place where the trains were divided. The death camp could not take more than 10 or 15 wagons at the time. And since the tra death trains coming from Warsaw or other places 
had sometimes 30 or 40 or 50 wagons. The Jews were staying or waiting for their turn to be pushed into the death camp. And in the summer or in the fall, squeezed 150 to a wagon, they were dying of thirst. Now, very few people survived Treblinka. Uh, to be more exact, about 100 people so out of 900,000 survived, mostly people who took part in an uprising. We have some testimonies. I know practically all of them which have been written. Um, and the scenes from Treblinka railway station are simply scenes out of Dante's ninth circle of hell. Um, there was no pity, and there were people bringing water, but there is uh, all Jewish uh, survivors, how not so many of them that we have, stress one thing. You could purchase, you could purchase water for diamonds, gold, dollars. There was no free, I have not seen one Jewish testimony that would say that anyone brought uh, this water uh, to heavily guarded trains out of their, their own their own, let's say, volition and um, without any uh, financial gain in mind. Now, the Polish authorities unveiled a monument in Treblinka to this courageous Pole who allegedly brought this water, um, brought this water out of altruistic devotion or willingness to help. Uh, there are no historical credible proofs to, uh, to, um, to uh, confirm this story, but it's not important. The important thing is that now Treblinka is already associated with, uh, let's say, national Polish sacrifice in order to help, to help uh, Jews at the, at the time of need. Um, now, if you, this is uh, not a very good photograph, but on the slide you can see that the monument unveiled this in honor of this brave Pole and 900,000 Jews who died. Uh, Treblinka. This what, this what happens here is your introduction to the distortion of the history of the Holocaust. Distortion is not built entirely on lies. It is built on half-truths and unsaid parts and lack of context. It is also very seducing sometimes to understand, let's say, to go follow this line of thought. Because usually people who distort Holocaust, they are offering a positive spin, a good um, and, let's say, a positive uh, vision of the past, which plays well with people who want to hear positive, uh, positive uh, news. Now, this uh, other slide that I, um, that I bring here to you um, is actually deals with, uh, with Auschwitz. How you can ask, uh, how can you distort or let's say distort the history of Auschwitz? Well, you can and you do. And, uh, nowadays in Poland, uh, over 50% of Poland people um, associate most of all Auschwitz with Polish suffering not Jewish suffering. Now, how it's being done, once again, not all of you know, but there are Auschwitz I, which is a concentration camp, where non-Jews were held as prisoners. It was not death camp. There is Auschwitz II, which is, uh, which is death camp, and 99% of its victims were Jews. Now, if you conflate these two, if you talk about what you see here, actually, is on the, on the third and third, first and third poster on the walls of uh, Warsaw building, you can see the sign, Poles were thirst victims or prisoners of death camp at Auschwitz, which is not true. They were not a death camp, they were a concentration camp. Nevertheless, this is the way in which this, uh, this Holocaust, uh, this uh, distortion starts to trickle in, starts to change. This is our Auschwitz, this is our Treblinka. Um, this is a slow and gradual process, and I am discussing the Polish case where it's especially visible, but it's, as you will see, by no means limited to, uh, to Poland, of course. So what happens in, what happens in uh, Poland nowadays is a number of uh, national myths, national myths which are being um, defended, which are being also enforced, in a way, by the authorities when, with the quite enthusiastic support of uh, 
uh, of various uh, so-called uh, NGOs that are devoted to this, uh, uh, to this line of activity. So what are these uh, myths which are so prevalent in Poland today? Well, one of them is that uh, Polish society was universally opposed to communism. Well, I can tell you that in 1980, um, when, um, when the communists started to shake, so to say, uh, during the Solidarity Times, there were three million uh, people in Poland who were members of the Polish Communist Party. So in any case, one of the myths is to present Polish society as always deeply anti-communist. Um, another was uh, the glorification of the role of Catholic Church. A number of these things that are being defended, but none of them you have ever probably heard about. And you would not care much about them either because they are only for internal consumption. The one and only, um, the one and only myth which sort of strikes uh, at, or brings, brings attention, draws attention of people around the world is a constant attempt to uh, present Polish-Jewish relations during the Holocaust uh, in a distorted, falsified light. So here, how it's being, how it's being done, this Holocaust distortion. Um, here you have a citation from uh, Polish Prime Minister, uh, one Mr. Morawiecki, and he says, as you can see, uh, that we are mem <laughs> remembering millions of Poles who rescued Jews. Now, it might, uh, in, the, uh, in the ears, uh, to the ears of historian, it is beyond laughable, of course. However, this is the, if you have a number of people in Poland who, uh, indeed, at a great risk to themselves, uh, tried to save the Jews, thousands of them actually, and you try to present these people as simply the, the um, default position of the entire society. This is how a distortion starts. Uh, repeating time and time again that our nation was a nation that basically um, did this tremendous sacrifice, which unfortunately has nothing to do with historical evidence but this is something that plays very well uh, with the expectations even of the society. People want to believe a positive, nice story that, uh, that uh, their forefathers um, did the right thing. Now, this uh, Polish um, defense, as it's called, of national honor is not, of course, a Polish specificity. And I am simply discussing this example because that's where I do my research. That's what I, um, <clears throat> where I also spend most of my time. But if you look around Eastern Europe, there is a general problem with coming to terms with history, more specifically with the history of uh, the Holocaust. And uh, you can look at Hungary. Um, I would uh, I would uh, strongly suggest that those of you who uh, never went to uh, to Budapest to Hungary, beautiful city, and uh, you will see at one of the main uh, squares of Budapest a monument. I call it a monument to uh, Hungarian innocence. There is a huge uh, monument of Archangel Gabriel, who represents Hungarian people being attacked viciously by this horrible great German black eagle. Um, and for those of you who don't know the history, there is even a writing 1944. What is the meaning of all of this? Well, Hungarians are innocent. The blame is entirely German. Well, the fact is that during the Holocaust, the German, um, Hungarian, Hungarian state, Hungarian institutions were deeply involved in deporting to their deaths 430,000 Hungarian Jews, something that today the Hungarian authorities are absolutely unwilling to, to admit. Uh, but also you have the same problem in Slovakia, with that Slovakia that sold to the Germans its Jews and, and deported them to their deaths uh, by tens of thousands. Lithuania, very much the same thing. I don't want to introduce, for obvious reasons, Ukraine. But if you look throughout the landscape of Eastern Europe, you can see that, uh, that there is this huge, um, huge problem. 
Now, the reason why, uh, why in Poland perhaps the reactions were indeed strongest, where the phenomenon is shining so brightly of distortion of the Holocaust, is the fact that, um, that, the, um, that Polish uh, society um, during the war, during Second World War, never had any political project associated with Germany. Germans were cruel invaders, and they were uh, indeed uh, bent upon destruction of Polish state institutions and so on and so forth. Now, in Ukraine, in Lithuania, in Hungary, these were either allies or people who hoped for some kind of future political project bound with Germany. In Poland, it had never, um, uh, took, it never took place. And uh, so for the Poles to be accused today of some complicity in the Holocaust, uh, of uh, taking part uh, on individual or not individual basis in inflicting misery on, uh, on their Jewish co-citizens is something that creates an absolute, uh, an absolute uh, um, uh, fury. Now, the, um, how, this, um, how these attempts are being done to distort, you have seen already a, a bit of it. And actually, they become more and more visible with every, uh, with every single, uh, with every single um, uh, year. A new phenomenon that we, do, that we see in Eastern Europe is also that, uh, um, that anti-Semitism becomes to an extent Salon fake, that it becomes again tolerable, as long as it's associated with uh, uh, anti communism. What you see here is the 2018 photograph of Polish, um, of Polish uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki, whom you have seen before. Uh, here he is laying uh, flowers on the, on the graves of, uh, of, um, of members of so called Holy Cross Brigade. Holy Cross, Cross Brigade was the only um, part of Polish resistance, unit of Polish resistance, who was so deeply uh, anti-communist that they decided to withdraw with the Germans in 1944-45 to the West with, with the Nazis together. Um, and by the way, it was a unit deeply involved in murders of the, uh, of the Jews. And this already is forgotten as long as your anti-communist credentials are, um, are uh, good enough. Now, uh, so the Polish state, especially since 2015, when the nationalists uh, came to power, um, decided that uh, the so-called dignity file, the defense of the good name of the nation, is at the very core of their social project is at the very core of who they are, the nationalists. And things started to move very quickly. How it's being done, I showed you the examples of distortion here, but of course there's many more. The thing is that when you combine strong opinions about history with the resources of the state, the results are indeed spectacular in the worst meaning of the word. So here what you see is proliferation of different of different institutes, of different um, also museums, exhibitions, uh, articles, books, publications. Um, what, uh, what, you can, what you can see here are two examples of uh, institutes which have been created uh, practically, um, one of them in Pilecki Institute uh, just recently, a few years back, the Institute of National Remembrance on the top, those are institutions that employ now hundreds of professional historians. They create historiographical streams. They, uh, the Institute of National Remembrance uh, is funded to the tune of 120 million US dollars per year, which in Polish conditions is three times or four times more given the level of salaries that it will be here. Um, the other institution has a budget now of about $50 million. So you can see in terms of historical impact, these institutions are geared toward Holocaust distortion. And the avalanche of production of 
quasi-intellectual end, what makes this, um, let's say, distortion of the Holocaust uh, is one of their, not the only, but one of their, um, of their um, uh, goals and also duties. Now, these things might shock you, but uh, uh, this, uh, this, um, uh, this fellow that you see here on, the, uh, on this uh, slide is, has been uh, one year ago appointed director of the second largest branch of this Institute of National Remembrance. Here he is a few years before raising his, uh, uh, his arm in so-called Hitlergruß or Hitler greeting. Uh, he was recalled soon after and demoted, but the thing is the, the fact that people with this kind of past can be appointed to directorial positions in institutes of national memory, uh, institutes which shape the way society thinks about its own past, it testifies to the institutional culture, or rather lack of it. Um, so, um, so this, just to give you example of some examples of how far these things have gone. Uh, this uh, actually does not require any other comment. What I want to introduce to you is here simply atmosphere in which discussion, if you can call it discussion, over the Holocaust evolves in Eastern Europe. Um, uh, it is not only the question of, uh, uh, let's say, dominating, dominating physical landscape like, for instance, uh, erecting the monuments. Uh, um, <clears throat> to, be, uh, to be more precise, I would like to tell you that in the immediate vicinity of Treblinka, um, Pilecki Institute that, by the way, uh, wants to open these days its um, big office in New York City, which I hope will never happen, but uh, um, I wouldn't hope, uh, hold my hopes too high. Um, the Pilecki Institute erected 10 other monuments devoted to uh, Poles who either allegedly or really helped the Jews. The idea is to dominate, dominate the physical space, but you also want to dominate the symbolic space in other ways. What you do here, for instance, you unveil a monument uh, to brave Poles who allegedly helped uh, the Jews. Uh, I was not always able to confirm it, um, but you do this on, in this case, on a date which is the date when local ghettos have been liquidated in that area. So in other words, you now you appropriate the, the date, the commemoration. September 22nd in eastern Poland, where this monument has been unveiled, on September 22nd, 1942, all local ghettos have been liquidated. It was an orgy of violence and horror, where local Jews were delivered to Treblinka, which was not very distant. And now, on the 22nd of September, you have a celebration of, uh, not of Jewish uh, victims, but of Poles who wanted to, wanted to, help, uh, wanted to help them. Um, and here we come to, uh, to the book, uh, Night Without End. Now, the thing is that uh, the book, by the way, I would like here to uh, offer my uh, a bit of uh, ad as uh, as um, uh, Rabinovich mentioned before, um, uh, the book will be out by Univers University of Indiana Press in August or September. Um, uh, so why about this book? Well, the thing is that, uh, uh, as you uh, might know, in January 2018, so four years ago, um, the Polish parliament, in its wisdom, voted itself something that we refer um, popularly as Polish Holocaust law. A Polish Holocaust law, which basically stipulated, let me um, quote verbatim, I quote, those who claim that the Polish nation or the Polish state bears responsibility for the crimes of World War II should of, um, will be, will be um, facing uh, uh, penalties of uh, three, um, three years in, in prison. Now, the thing is that um, this, uh, this law has been understood quite correctly as an attempt to muzzle, uh, to muzzle uh, Polish historians, to introduce atmosphere of, uh, of, uh, of fear. Uh, and uh, it so happened that uh, this book has been published three months later in the atmosphere of this huge tension 
Uh, this Polish Holocaust law, which called for three years in prison for people who dared to talk about, uh, um, let's say, complicity of segments of Polish society uh, with the Germans, uh, and thing which is actually deeply proven in historical evidence. Um, so in the midst of this um, uh, book that I co-edited and co-wrote uh, um, uh, appeared on the market. The problem was that this book was uh, a scholarly process and endeavor, as you can imagine. The fruit of work of nine historians over, over five years. Um, what we did was simply we descended to the level of so-called microhistory, looking at nine small regions looking at Jewish survival tactics, Jewish survival strategies after the liquidation of the ghettos. The ones when the Jews fled the liquidated ghettos, the idea was to look what happened to these <clears throat> Jews who had a working chance to survive. Those who never were caught and dragged into death trains, but those who fled on so-called Aryan side. And it was a huge study, two volumes, 1,600 pages, uh, thousands of footnotes. Uh, it was as, as academic work as you can imagine. And one of our conclusions, because we could, we could observe, you know, go down to the level of indi individual trajectories, one of, our, one of our conclusions was that in vast majority of cases, close to 70% of cases, the, the Jews who tried to uh, flee uh, were intercepted and killed with direct or indirect role of their Polish neighbors. And this was something that the Polish authorities could absolutely not, uh, not stomach. Um, so it was in this, uh, this moment that this campaign of hate uh, uh, erupted, and uh, that's when uh, when we started to, uh, to see, uh, we as historians started to see the, the effects of law, um, of the Polish Holocaust law being applied. Now, the thing is that under tremendous, under tremendous international pressure, mostly US pressure, uh, the Polish government decided to decriminalize um, uh, the provisions of the law. In other words, you are not going to prison. And that's when, uh, that's when um, uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki said that we believe that these people should be in prison, I quote, but we have to act bearing in mind international realities, and that's what we, why we take them into uh, account. Now, the problem is that the same stay, at the same point, Polish government said that what we will not do in terms of criminal um, prosecution, we'll do in terms of civil litigation. We shall use, they said, the friendly NGOs. We shall use here, um, we shall use here friendly NGOs, they are called gongos, or government organized NGOs, in order to go after historians who dare, as they said, to slander the good name of, uh, uh, of the Polish uh, nation. Now, at the same time, at the same time, um, the ruling nationalistic party in Poland promised that uh, that uh, there is one area of historical pursuit which has to be evaluated from the point of view of Polish raison d'état, or reason of state, of reason of Polish policy, and this is the um, the. Polish-Jewish relations during the Shoah. Now, the book, the book um, was published in April 2018, and that's when the, um, the let's say, attack really started. Uh, and uh, the Polish Minister of Education and Science, um, referring to this scientific work, called it, I quote, anti-Polish Nazi rag. This is the kind of language which now is being, uh, is being, um, uh, is being used. Now, interestingly, a few months later, I and my co-editor learned that we're being sued in the court of law um, for falsifications of history. And that's when it really became very interesting. Um, uh, and in the beginning, we were 
led to believe that the civil lawsuit, and the perverted thing is that once you sue someone in the court of civil litigation, there is no sentiment of, let's say, persecution. I mean, people have a right to uh, fight for their honor. It's natural, only natural. Um, but when you scratch the surface, you will see what happens. So we were informed that there is a lawsuit because in 1,600 pages, in one paragraph written by my co-editor, not by me, um, a, a Polish village mayor has been accused of complicity with the Germans. In reality, however, the niece of the long deceased uh, village elder claimed that this was not true, that her family reputation was, uh, was hurt, and she requested uh, this and this and that, plus, plus um, uh, compensation and so on and so forth. Now, it didn't take much time to find out that uh, at the bottom of the story, it was not the issue of family honor, it was not the issue of one niece trying to somehow fight for the good name of her family. It was direct application of this, what Prime Minister Morawiecki announced in June, in June uh, 2018. Namely, it was uh, an attempt to muzzle historians going uh, on the, after them uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in, in this matter of uh, civil litigation. Uh, we learned quickly that uh, the force behind was a government-sponsored NGO um, um, geared toward this kind of, uh, uh, of an uh, attack. Now, what was the deliberations of the court during the pandemic were not easy. I was commuting to Warsaw on several occasions. Um, the trial lasted and lasted. What became very quickly obvious is that uh, the authorities which were behind this lawsuit had a far-reaching design in there, and they still, still have a far-reaching design in, uh, in their minds. Uh, we learned quickly one thing, that uh, the lawsuit wanted to introduce uh, uh, into Polish civil litigation a new concept. Normally, you have something called personal rights, such as your family honor. And this is easily understood. It's obvious. If somebody tells something outrageous about your reputation, you have a right to contest it in court. However, here, the opposing side introduced a new kind of personal goods, and they were indeed uh, surprising. These new kind of personal goods which need to be defended in a court of law included now, according to this lawsuit, the right to national pride. Uh, the right to national pride, the right to national identity. Uh, furthermore, uh, we were told that whenever anyone, any reader of our book, would feel that his or her national pride has been hurt, he or she could sue historians in court. Now, to be honest with you, if, uh, uh, if this definition were introduced into Polish jurisprudence, there would be no more history of the Holocaust, critical history of the Holocaust, uh, to be done in Poland. Because concepts such as national pride has never been defined in legal terms and can never be defined in legal terms. Now, it's not only this thing. Second uh, thing that happened in a court which had, I would say, global importance, not global, but international importance, because believe me, many governments were watching these proceedings with much interest. Many governments, most of them autocratic, but not only, have a strong tendency to hold, let's say, um, to keep under control the way the societies think about their own past. If you can use civil litigation in order to, uh, to arrive at that goal, then that's definitely worth their, um, their time. So when in February 20, uh, last year, a year ago, um, uh, we heard uh, in court uh, the, the, the verdict, which went against us, I was, uh, I was very, not only upset, of course, because what the Warsaw, Warsaw Court, Warsaw District Court decided was something very, very, very uh, unsettling. For one, the court recognized that indeed national pride and national dignity are 
personal goods which can be defended in a court. So in other words, whenever someone feels offended that, that their national pride has been wounded by, by this what you wrote, they can go to court. From point of view of historian of the Holocaust, once again, it is a deadly proposition. But it went much further. The second part of the verdict, which basically did not condemn us entirely, but partially, said that, that uh, um, historians have no right to judge importance, to create differences of value between different historical sources. And the judge in Warsaw decided that if I, as a historian, if I, as a historian, have two sources, one of which says that something happened this way, but another source tells me that something happened in a different way, then I cannot choose one or the other. I cannot go to any judgment at all. Now, unfortunately, in history, uh, we are trained after decades and decades of work to recognize sources for what they are. There are some sources which have greater value from historical point of view than other sources. In the case at hand, in our case, what was so galling was the fact that the, that the court in Warsaw decided that uh, a testimony of Jewish survivor was worth less or equally as a, a document issued by Polish court in 1950. Now, in the study of the Holocaust, we do assign particular importance to the testimony of Jewish survivors for a variety of reasons which I don't want to go into right here. However, by, by the end of the day, in February 19, sorry, 2021, um, we were informed that it was, in Poland at least, no longer possible that if you were faced with contradicting testimony, a historian could not, uh, could not choose uh, I could not choose anything. Once again, this, in terms of study and writing about the Holocaust, if applied, would put an end to any critical discussion. But it was, of course, not only this. It was the chilling atmosphere. You have to remember that this attack of the state-sponsored agents, in this case, this Gongo and the NGO behind it, was in, its intent was to paralyze, of course, uh, other historians into silence. But it went further. Uh, in Warsaw court, we heard very disturbing things about the value of Jewish testimony per se. Um, and this was something that I found deeply offensive. Namely, we were told in the courtroom that, look at these Jewish testimonies. These Jews tend to change their story, you know. This uh, survivor in 1943, she says one thing. In 1944, she changes her story. In 1946, it's a different story. And in 1996, still another story. Uh, when I responded that uh, Jews who did not change their story during the war were dead, um, it was not actually... Uh, greeted with much, uh, much satisfaction. Now, so this was the state of affairs when we applied, and um, we went to the, uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Court of Appeals, which, uh, and as I am glad to, uh, to report, um, overturned the decision and basically um, um, uh, declared me and my colleague innocent of all of all charges and dismissed the lawsuit entirely. Now, the thing is that this, all of this is being done in the context of the destruction of independence of Polish judiciary. It is a different topic, which I don't have time to, to dwell uh, on um, uh, this evening. Uh, however, um, for those of, you, those of you who know a bit what's going on right now in Europe, uh, you do know that um, that uh, uh, Polish judiciary has been under vicious attack and um, uh, judges are being dismissed from work uh, and uh, a decision that has been made by the, by the judge of uh, appellate court in our case was an example of bravery. It took really some major uh, courage to go against. As you can see here, the citation is from the Minister of Justice himself who called this uh, who called this verdict uh, 
as you can see, coup d'etat against justice itself. So this is the kind of institutional climate in which, uh, in which uh, one uh, works. Now, the thing is, it's not yet, uh, and I'm here not basically to present to you the details of a court case. I'm here to present to you the threats of, uh, of uh, facing a Holocaust memory, Holocaust commemoration. And uh, once it meets, uh, let's say, hostile energy of a powerful state. And we are talking here more about Poland because similar things are being contemplated and done in several other countries. Now, the thing is, all these things have, um, have a long-lasting impact. Namely, if you have convenient and happy lies repeated uh, from various angles over years and years and years, they do transform, they do transform histor the, historical, uh, the historical consciousness of the nation. Um, you, um, given the resources, given the pace of this uh, and the uh, let's say, the energy with which this distortion is being performed, um, you, can, you can hardly, um, um, let's say, be surprised when you see this recent poll uh, which uh, uh, asks a question, should we charge in court historians who write about Polish complicity in the Holocaust? And here you have uh, close to 40% uh, of people who do agree. Now, mind you, the question is not, uh, should we charge in court historians who write false things about. No, you have a question simply about historians who write about Polish complicity. So if you have um, at this stage 40% of people who uh, think, agree with this and you have 11% of those who are not entirely certain one way or the other, it, is a, uh, it shows you that we do have a problem indeed. And this final graph that, uh, that uh, I would like to bring to your attention um, is uh, something that, uh, that I find uh, shocking. And uh, this is uh, mm, um, slowly moving towards conclusion to show you how, uh, on how thin ice we are actually skating. Uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that we are nearing this Orwellian place, this Orwellian vision that who controls the present controls the past. Uh, uh, if you look here at this uh, declining, declining blue, uh, blue line, um, uh, and, uh, and you can look at this growing orange line, especially at the declining blue line, uh, who suffered more during World War II? Uh, Jews, both nations and Poles. Um, it is, a pro as you can see over the years, uh, this, 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 removal of Jews from, from this, say, say, suffering during the Holocaust has become, has become a, a problem uh, of, I would say, um, existential from my, uh, from, my point, uh, uh, from my point of view proportions. Now, so in conclusion here, I would like simply to, uh, to, um, to tell you that we no longer can take for granted the memory of the Holocaust. The reason I'm here today with you is actually to impart this, uh, um, uh, this, uh, uh, this information, this, also this plea that we cannot uh, take for granted even things which uh, one would think are so firmly established. No, they are not. Um, if, uh, if you think that uh, the memory, very often in, my, uh, in, uh, in our historians' meetings uh, uh, devoted to the history of the Holocaust, we were, we were wondering what will happen once the generation of survivors passes on. Well, the thing is that uh, a, a vision of this can be seen through the prism of what's already going on uh, in uh, in Eastern Europe or in Poland. It is a new kind of distortion which can, uh, which can threaten the memory, the commemoration of the Holocaust. And basically what, uh, what happens depends to a large degree of uh, how, all, how we all shall react to it, whether we will decide that uh, this is basically not an important issue, or if you look at today's manipulation that's going on during the conflict in uh, in. 
uh, in Ukraine and how uh, the Russian society is exposed to uh, these fundamental untruths, you will see that this has an existential meaning to uh, all of us. So with this, I conclude and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Gorovsky, for that wonderful uh, and really provocative uh, um, presentation. And I'd like to take open this up to questions from the audience. I'm sure there are plenty. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I was actually wondering if you could speak a little bit on the similarities. I don't know if you're as familiar with it, but we have politicians in the US who are fighting to change our perception of the slave uh, of slavery and the United States history with racism. They're fighting to change that in the name of national pride. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to the similarities that we see globally in, on this topic of national pride being a justification for why we can't uh, right. compare history. Yeah, I mean, the thing is that uh, politicians love so-called usable history, history they can use. And this is, uh, this is international, this is general. A history that is a huge temptation to uh, create yourself a cozy, nice part of history which you can use. Now, the, the, the difference, the difference, I mean, I am not, uh, an American. I don't know your uh, system as, and your, uh, your problems uh, as well as I should, perhaps. But from what I understand, um, okay. the, the thing is, sorry? I, was just, I said it's OK. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing is that, that you are not facing, in this case, a hostile state. For me, the, 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 really the important thing is what one politician or another does is a question of minor importance to me, as, the, as long as they do not have the entire might of the state at their disposal. Secondly, from what I understand, education in the, state is, in the States, as in Canada, is largely decided on provincial or state level which also um, uh, tends to be uh, to weaken the impact of, let's say, uh, central notions. Uh, it's not that uh, you don't have your challenges, you do. Uh, finally, uh, as a professor in Canadian University, each time something happens in states, we feel the tremors uh, across the border. Um, uh, but, uh, but the thing is that, that what, you, what I don't see here is this existential threat of a state and in a concerted effort, as I see it in, in Poland, for instance. Um, that was, uh, it was, it was fascinating and troubling. I'm wondering, when you look back at this chart and look back at what's happened in Poland, um, do you take any lessons from it that can be applied, as you say, other states are now beginning to pursue the same path look at what has happened in Poland, perhaps learn some techniques. I wonder, as a historian, but also when you talk about historians getting together, um, witnessing it is one thing, analyzing it is one thing, but in terms of fighting it, um, are there any lessons you take that, that perhaps internationally right. could, could apply uh, well, here? One thing is... I'm Jonathan Kaufman. I'm the that, head of the journalism school here. Thank you. Uh, the thing is that uh, one uh, I did not mention it. This uh, uh, this trial, this uh, that I that I discussed briefly with you. Um, at certain, I was and I am very much a research-oriented scholar. Uh, I you know I would never four years ago, five years ago, I would never imagine being myself in current situation being forced to uh, do something that we call in French uh, travail d'historien engagé, or so-called uh, uh, public historian's work doing. Uh, but this, uh, I decided at a certain point that this is important enough to basically invest a year or a year and a half of my life into uh, alerting people around the world. And what I must say is that uh, 
even over the course of last year, I have seen extraordinary mobilization of historical profession uh, around this issue and against these techniques. Uh, I believe that this is a lasting um, uh, historians, of, not only historians, but uh, um, scholars of the Holocaust, most of all, but this spills over to different domains as well, became aware that we are dealing here with the anti-intellectual storm that is coming our way that needs to be addressed. Uh, now, whether or not uh, this will be a long-lasting uh, consciousness, I don't know. But what happened, which was uh, I was extraordinarily uh, grateful for, was this extraordinary mobilization of humanists, at least, but not only, um, in order to defend our right to, uh, to, to basically uh, to think in an independent way. Um, how successful it will be, I have no idea. The problem is that there are several states that uh, do actively want to pursue this line of, uh, of uh, distortion in various areas, and, uh, um, but this struggle only begins. So, you know, it's, uh, it's too early to say, but I am very encouraged, but because really this, this, this uh, support I and my co-authors uh, received uh, was extraordinary, was extraordinary. So uh, if there is something good out of it, uh, that's definitely it. Hi, thank you so much for the lecture. Um, my question is about museums. Uh, specifically, uh, what is the current level of state influence in museums, such as the Museum of the History of the Polish Jews in Warsaw, and where do you see that going in the future? Right. Um, first of all, the, uh, the authorities in Poland are extraordinarily generous as far as museums are concerned, as long as their museums are concerned. And they, they have, they are building now a museum in Warsaw called the Museum of Warsaw Ghetto, uh, which according to the Minister of Culture is supposed to be, I quote here, a museum of, of Polish Jewish love. And now uh, there are still independent museums such as the Museum of uh, history of Polish Jews in Warsaw, a wonderful um, a building, uh, and a museum which is co-governed by the city of Warsaw, which is independent. I don't want to go into details, but this is one of the few remaining fairly independent uh, centers. And the majority of other museums which are totally dependent on the state are following the party line. So uh, the museums, uh, uh, there, is, there are museums uh, a special museum has been opened five years ago uh, to celebrate Poles saving uh, the Jews uh, during the war, um, and uh, this kind of pressure is uh, felt throughout. So, uh, so, um, uh, so I would say that a uh, huge push is to have the museums on board and, um, let's say, fulfilling or filling the mandate confined to them by the state. Thank you. Thank you for bringing this to uh, our attention. But I'm wondering if you would comment on the 2019 controversy with the, uh, museum of, the Holocaust Museum of Remembrance in Washington when there, had, when there was a statement that uh, historians, uh, that there was the worry of making analogies to the Holocaust. <laughs> and, and I wonder if you might bring that in, because right. that too was a, a situation where historians and those of us who were in the social sciences had to respond you uh, are in entirely. a way that was really right. very important, and I, w I wish you'd comment on that. Very right. Much. I mean, if, if I recall well, it was the time when, when uh, the museum, uh, the USHMM, the, the, made this declaration that you are not supposed to compare, uh, to compare Holocaust to a... Uh, which I think uh, was entirely wrong. Um, and uh, and uh, if in history we are denied the right to seek comparisons, we are basically losing many tools of our profession. Uh, the problem is that many people who are deeply devoted to the study of Holocaust, uh, unfortunately, um, sort of place that tragedy, that this genocide on a different level um, uh, and uh, on a 
Um, and this is not conducive, I would say, to, uh, to any kind of intellectual exchange. So uh, I believe there was a strong reaction against, uh, against this, um, uh, this declaration, and uh, I don't know how successful uh, was it, but uh, I, I, I entirely agree with you that, uh, that um, we can be, for instance, convinced about certain uniqueness of the event. That's quite true, but there is no uh, reason to deny a possibility of uh, looking at similarities and comparing. Uh, this is what we as historians should do, of course, if this answers your question. Hi, thanks again for the talk. I know you mentioned uh, during the course of it that you didn't want to talk about Ukraine or that, we did, that it was obvious why we shouldn't talk about Ukraine, but I'd like to talk about Ukraine. Um, <laughs> I, I just feel as if it's very hard to to figure out how you you know appreciate and acknowledge the, the heroism of the Ukrainians without distorting the, the history and not um, pretending as if it is a more positive one than it was, especially when it comes mm -hmm. to the Jews and the Holocaust and and how you how we should think about those two things. You know, um, actually now uh, I have several friends, um, um, historians of the Holocaust from the Ukraine, and um, two of them um, uh, in exchange uh, uh, with me uh, told me they are from the school of critical assessment of Ukrainian past. They are not afraid of discussing the most murky, the most dark um, uh, issues in the history of uh, Ukrainian uh, Jewish interaction horrors which took place, of course, we know all about, not all about it, but a lot about it. And, and now um, one of them, two of them actually t told me that now they are being shamed into silence because the, the argument is how can you talk about bad, sad, or compromising parts of our history when our nation is going through this horror, that you are being basically agents of Putin, you are agents of Russia, uh, to which my answer is, uh, no, uh, the, we are not uh, debating today's Ukrainian society, and uh, I believe that, uh, that, the, that we have to, especially at a time of trouble and problems, uh, stare openly at our past and not be afraid, and I would never uh, ever, let's say, agree to any kind of uh, silence. Uh, today, the reason why I passed uh, uh, over the Ukrainian example is simply I have so many other examples. Um, but, uh, but to answer your question, I believe that uh, each nation has not a right but obligation uh, to be able to look at, uh, at its own past in a critical way. Because once we close our eyes to darker parts of our history, we are basically going uh, this path that you have seen today here. Well, I, I, since we're talking about Ukraine, <laughs> um, I, 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 will, I will ask a question as well. Which is, so one thing that um, I, I very much noticed in Ukraine, and um, it, it's certainly the case in Hungary as well, and, and I believe in Poland as well, um, is the, the, that the negative associations between Jews and communism in the post-World War II um, era have a direct relationship to reluctance to memorialize the Holocaust and to um, uh, to suggest that uh, Jews were victims, let's say, of Ukrainians or of Poles or of Hungarians, because the public perception it was is quite the opposite that Hungarians, Ukrainians, Poles were in the communist period victims of the Jews. I can give you an, an example. I was actually traveling in in rural Ukraine once. Um, with a Ukrainian academic, and there was a, a large billboard um, that had an image of, of starved bodies in black and white. It could have been from the famine in Ukraine, or it could have been from the Holocaust. It wasn't clear, but in Ukrainian it said in, in red letters, communism equals death. And I said to the person I was traveling with, I said, so how much do people understand from that when, when it says communism that they mean Jews? And she said, oh, everybody understands that. <laughs> um, and one of the things that I, I and now when it comes to, 
to Ukraine today. I think the interesting thing is, is that how much U Ukrainian identity itself um, has changed even as the past continues to be distorted in important ways. But my question, and I promise there's a question in here, uh, is that how does that affect the Polish government's efforts to paint this period as, as being one of mutual aid and, and help and, and friendship? Well, the thing is that, uh, that it is actually looking for logic is very here difficult. To tell you the, the truth, um, today the people and organizations uh, which are in the forefront of uh, this uh, memorial pressure to recognize Polish sacrifice at the altar of uh, alleged Polish-Jewish friendship are organization of uh, right, extreme right-wing nationalists uh, um, for whom these Jews, of course, are nothing but a proxy and they are just an excuse in order to, um, to do something that, uh, that this uh, Holocaust distortion really excels at, which is basically transforming the history of the Shoah into a positive image of Gentile, let's say, um, Gentile sacrifice. Uh, so um, it is, I would say, not surprising in this context that you, the Jews are irrelevant. Jews are not important. The idea is to, given the importance of the Holocaust, you have to take the Holocaust and to empty the Holocaust from its real meaning and to, let's say, pour another kind of uh, narrative into this shell, and this is what, uh, what happens. So once again, it has nothing to do with uh, political convictions. Uh, at the core is the nationalistic belief in own historical superiority. And, and this is the, the, the troubling part is that this sells very well. That this is, um, for me, what, uh, what was striking was when I looked at the votes in Polish parliament, it was absolutely amazing that uh, the only, and I'm, until, until the war, um, the Soviet aggression invasion of Ukraine started, practically the only area in which Polish opposition parties voted together with the nationalists in power was that exactly dignity file, the defense of the good name of the nation. Here you could, you could, you could, you could, you could see people of extreme right coming to, uh, together and uh, shaking hands with people of even far left. So, so this is a, a political, so to say, bridge that, that, that is one of the last remaining bridges or until the invasion uh, of Ukraine was one of the last bridges. Um, this is such a powerful subject and so deeply disturbing on so many levels. Um, I think the most powerful for those of us who are in the business of education is the chilling effect on research, on what goes on in the classroom, in the, in the publication of books. And I think that uh, what you're offering us is um, a particularly dramatic example because of the legal support for this kind of suppression of something that I think the student pointed out correctly. We are feeling here and is being felt all over the world in terms of surveillance around the kind of research and discovery that's permissible and the ways in which political divisions are finding um, expression in, uh, in what constitutes knowledge and what constitutes truth. And, um, and, it, and for many of us who have been liberal educators, you know, we, we have prided ourselves on, the, on the studying the relationship between subjectivity and interest and and discovery, and now I think some of that liberalism is coming back to bite us with a great vengeance. But I think the other thing that I wanted to ask you about, but it's more, it's a more intimate question, is um, how, and maybe an extension of your question, Simon, the how people reconcile these big national shared goals of being proud of being Poles with their more intimate family histories and their more intimate experience of Jew hatred. And their, you know, it was one thing to be in 1942, but 1968 was also a thing in living memory for people that anti-Semitism is 
it, you don't have to scratch very hard for it to surface right now among people and they are aware of, the, it, they're living in homes, the homes of Jews. There's a Jewish keech in Polish culture that's not unlike you know, the way Americans have treated Native American culture as a kind of, you know, the, the genus, like on the, what's the, the, I don't know, the grotesqueness of, um, of celebrating a culture that has been genocided. We see that in Poland, and I guess I, my, the secondary question on that is, you have this tourism industry of the camps that where Jews from all over the world are visiting the sites of genocide, where their own families have been genocided, and what kind of disconnect is necessary for the Poles to be, and I, I mean, when we visited most recently, there was a real effort among my colleagues and uh, even Jews in Poland today, few as they may be, to say, to try to make claims about Polish goodness. Um, so I, I just, I feel like there's a lot of space gaps mm -hmm. between, yeah. Um, yeah, that's. No, you are entirely right. First of all, I would like to say that there is a huge also swell of ground, let's say, movement uh, in the Polish society to actually uh, be respectful, to recognize the wrongs of the past. There are very, very many very good people doing very good work. And so I would never like to convey an image that there is this anti-Semitic bloc. And, uh, but the problem is that, of course, uh, as someone who was uh, born and raised uh, in Polish language, uh, the uh, anti-Semitic cliches are functioning also on the level of language. The word Żyd in Polish, Jew, carries a huge emotional negative value. And, and so, so even at the most basic level of, con of concepts, there is a problem. Now, if you, um, if you look at this popular culture, you mentioned uh, in figures of, uh, of Jew with a coin, right? It's, uh, those of you who don't know, there is a very popular thing you can buy on markets uh, across uh, Poland. You can buy yourself a little Jew with a little coin. Why? Because Jews are associated with uh, wealth. So uh, I remember we last uh, few, few months ago, I ventured to a store and there was this, uh, you can buy these pictures of Jews counting money. Right, um, golden pieces and uh, a very strong association, Jews with gold, with horrible effects during the war, by the way. So I see this painting on the wall of this Pierogi place, and, uh, but I see that the painting is hanging upside down with the Jew with his head pointed downwards. So uh, uh, as an observer of, uh, of this uh, scenery, I ask the lady at the counter, why is your Jew hanging upside down? And she smiles at me and says, don't you know? Well, this way, uh, the money will fall out of his pockets. Um, and so th these are the things that you can, that you can encounter on, on, on a daily basis. But to respond to your question, uh, with this disjoint and this, 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 this uh, divorce between, uh, between knowledge even and, uh, and, uh, and perceptions, the problem is that in Eastern Europe, and not only in Poland, I strongly believe history fulfills the role of partially, role of religion. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, in, if you are discussing, um, you do not discuss religion. In other words, with people who are religiously minded, um, you are not trying to, let's say, have a discussion uh, on the basic tenets of their faith, uh, because you believe it or you don't. So I fear that, um, that, uh, that many aspects of national history acquire certain, in Poland definitely, acquire, uh, acquire certain likely, likeliness to, uh, to religious uh, um, feeling. And then, of course, you can have all possible contrast and contradictions which will be easily absorbed, if this answers your question. This is my own, my own theory. I, can, I would like to defend it, but of course, you know, I might be wrong. I'm going to borrow it, actually. <laughs> History Welcome. as religion in Eastern Europe. I, I, I think it's really, it's very much right on point. And, and like you said, that it, these are narratives that become so difficult to challenge. Um, I, I guess maybe, are, th are there any final, final questions? Well, then maybe that's the perfect place to end it. Um, history, history as religion, and and hopefully, um, hopefully in the future the response to these political efforts and to these legal efforts will be uh, more and better history. Um, that's, 
I always try to leave it on an optimistic <laughs> note, even if I don't believe it. So, <laughs> so with that, thank you so much, well, Professor thank you, Grabowski. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a great night. Thank you very much.